Um, so everything we talked about with rabies applies to the cat. So, you know, once a year vaccine, once every three year. And let me make a note. I don't know how much you guys have talked about it with cats. Um, and this is a little side note. Um, you know, rabies is usually always right rear. And when we do vaccines, and especially in cats, we want to give the vaccine lower. You know, vaccines used to always, in my day, they were always given over the shoulder blades. And that was kind of just, you gave all shots in the same place. And the reason we started seeing in cats uh, what's called vaccine-induced sarcomas. Um, and it's a cancer called fibrosarcoma. And the problem with fibrosarcoma, it, it can start and, and it can look like a lump. And sometimes, you know, if, if a cat, if any animal is going to have a reaction to a vaccine, and sometimes they do get a lump because sometimes when you tent the skin, if you don't get a good angle, you do end up giving the vaccine intradermal. You actually give it in the skin layer. And usually I tell clients you can do a warm compress, you can massage it, it should go away. Vaccine induced tumors or sarcomas will actually show up later. They are usually not right after the vaccine. Um, I mean, it can be much, much later. Um, but what happens is when a fibrosarcoma grows, it actually grows, it looks small on the surface, but the problem is they have like cellular fingers or they tend to spread. And so when you remove a vaccine-induced sarcoma, you have to take a large amount of tissue because what happens is if you just cut out the little tumor, like if you just cut around the tumor, you leave cells behind and then it's gonna pop up with little tumors around it. Um, so the key is, it, the problem is when you do it over the shoulder blades, it's very hard to get, and you actually have to cut down almost to the muscle layer. You're supposed to remove the skin, you know, the epidermis, the dermis, part of the subcutaneous, almost to another fascial plane, which would be the muscle. And that's a lot of tissue to take. So um, what they started recommending is if you give it over a limb and you give it like below the hip, if an animal was to get this sarcoma, you can do an amputation. And I know that that sounds aggressive, but these tumors can be aggressive and these tumors can spread. So you, you know, if, if you give it over the right limb, you can actually amputate. Some people were advocating give it in the skin over the tail, which is not a great place to give a cat a shot, but you could amputate the tail very simply. And Catherine's exactly right. I mean, I would much rather have a three-legged cat than a cat full of cancer. Um, but we radiated, when I worked in oncology, we actually ra radiated some of these cases. Um, and we had a really tough case where the cat had a very large sarcoma and it wasn't a very big cat and they had taken so much skin, but they didn't take enough. And it came back with little tumors, but unfortunately they couldn't remove any more skin because the skin was too tight. So what we had to do was do radiation to try and, and irradiate the cancer that was left behind. So I've, I've radiated these cases, I've seen these sarcoma cases come into oncology. So you really need to go by the new rules. And just because I said rabies, rabies right rear, RRR, normally there should be and like I said, this could, I might be repeating information, but I think it's important. Whenever you give a vaccine, you should put in the chart. Usually we save the sticker from the bottle and you should at least record, have the serial number, which is on the bottle. Know your manufacturer, put the date and the location because if for some reason a cat does get a vaccine and do sarcoma, the client can get money from the vaccine company. But the problem is they need detailed records from the vet. So we would send the records to the vaccine manufacturer like Marielle or whatever, and they need all of that documented. And so I did have a few clients that did get money towards the treatment. Um, 
because they were able to get the documentation to the company. So that's, it's important on the vet's part, the, the regular vet that does the vaccine to make sure we have all that information. So if I didn't bring that up yesterday, and I would say we see vaccine-induced sarcomas more in cats than we do dogs. But typically in dogs, we also recommend a location over a limb just in case. But um, I will say I saw way more cats than dogs. So as far as rabies, all of that applies to the cat, but we'll talk about um, feline upper respiratory disease, which this group is caused by, it can be caused by a different group of viruses. So you have FVR, which is the viral rhinotracheitis, and right in the word, rhino means nose, tracheitis, trachea means tracheitis inflammation. So nasal and tracheal viral inflammation. Um, <clears throat> and this is caused by the herpes virus. So typically the rhinotracheitis is from the herpes virus. And then you also have feline calice virus. So either one of those can cause this upper respiratory disease. Um, but it's all over the world. Any cat can be affected. And unfortunately, transmission, it's extremely contagious. It's very easy to spread. So obviously, you have to think about if you have a lot of cats. So if an owner has like multiple cats, if they're in a breeding facility, but shelters, your clinic, your kennel. I mean, the worst thing I can remember about being in practice and I remember when I was in high school, we had a big cat ward. And I remember one cat sneezing out at me like this green stuff. And I told my boss, I'm like, this cat was boarding. And sometimes the stress of boarding will bring this out. So the cat was obviously stressed. It's in the kennel. But once it starts sneezing, pretty much within about that three to five day period, almost all these cats in the room we're on medications. And sometimes when we get a group of cats from the shelter, we put them in our cat room and then all of a sudden they start sneezing, sneezing, sneezing. So obviously, you know, tr you know, direct contact, obviously if it's on, you know, a bowl, a cage door, um, anything in the room, toys, um, but it's aerosolized. Um, so once they sneeze, any mucus, or any droplets are going to carry these viruses. Um, and then inanimate objects like fomites. So, well, direct contact, if you, and I know sometimes we let the cats play and they come nose to nose, or you have a cat out and it puts its nose in another cat's cage. So direct contact or contact with the cage door, toys, bowls, um, is going to spread all of these viruses. And unfortunately, even if they don't come into contact, once they sneeze out their door and the air carries it into the cage next door, it, it's almost impossible. Rather, you know, you got to get the cat. If they're showing any symptoms like that, it's best to try to get the cat in isolation into a separate um, area. Now, FVH or F. FHV1, so the herpes, um, it is susceptible to most regular disinfectants. Um, it can survive 18 to 24 hours outside the host. So again, it does not typically need um, a hardy environment, or I'm, I'm sorry, a lot of cleaning or freezing. So it's gonna, you know, die off. Um, Khaleesi virus, though, is more resistant, and it can survive for outside the host for several days. So versus the 18 to 24 hours for the herpes, Khaleesi virus is, um, is actually going to have, um, you know, Khaleesi virus is more resistant. And the preferred disinfect disinfectant is going to be bleach. So that is the preferred disinfectant for Khaleesi virus. Now, herpes virus, most of your disinfectants, Rocal, uh, 
we use, we use trifecta, trifecta, you know, um, the other ones are going to usually kill it. The problem is with their clinical signs um, is you can't really tell the difference initially between Khaleesi virus and herpes virus. So they're going to, you know, obviously these guys are anorexic um, and then they're depressed because, you know, it just makes them feel kind of crummy. Um, they usually have a fever and then bing, 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 nasoocular discharge. It can start in the eye. It can progress to two eyes and then it can progress to a bilateral nasal discharge. It usually affects both nostrils because it's all of the respiratory tissue. Um, and then obviously sneezing. I mean, this is very classic. The cat's like, tch, tch, tch. and the other thing that's kind of not on here, but what I, you know, most cats, if they have ocular nasal, nasal discharge, they take their paws and they kind of like, and so sometimes if you look at their forelimbs, their forelimbs are coated with like mucus. Their fur is matted or they're excessively grooming their legs because they get kind of like, whenever, whenever they rub their eyes and nose, they kind of, their forelimbs can look, um, I'm gonna say the very, very scientific term, gunky. Um, but because they groom, they do that. Now with the, um, you can start to see corneal ulcers. Now obviously you would have to do, um, a fluorescein stain, but if the eye, you know, an animal that has an ulcer, which is when they're kind of the surface of the cornea actually develops a defect and it kind of can look like a divot, but that cat is also more than likely really squinting their eye because that's extremely painful. So sometimes you won't see a corneal ulcer, but you'll see like they won't open one eye um, now, sometimes what I will see with these guys um, is that their inner eyelids get so swollen that their eyes start to swell shut with mucus. Sometimes what I've had to do with cats, I've also had to do this with my son. He got a really bad upper respiratory infection and he woke up and his eyelids were matted shut because he had you know, a little baby and he was sick. So I took a warm washcloth. I ran it kind of under pretty warm, hot water, squeezed it out, and then I just held the wash rag on his eyes to soften up the discharge. And then I could lightly wipe it away and I could get his eye to open. And I've sometimes definitely had to do that with cats. That's, a, you know, if they have bad nasal discharge or ocular discharge where it's matted, is sometimes you can take a gauze take a stack of gauze, kind of like get hot water, warm water, and just kind of hold it there for a little bit. And then you can wipe. Because if you try to wipe it away, sometimes it's just too crusted and it can be painful when you try to pull it off. So if you soften it up on there, you almost have to pick their nose. I know that sounds, uh, but sometimes I will like pick away the stuff at their nose um, to help them feel better. Now, it can cause abortion or birth defects if they are pregnant. So if they are carriers, um, it can actually cause those. Sometimes you will all, you all see, um, you'll see oral ulcers. I feel like in Khaleesi virus, more you see this. Khaleesi virus, if I see mouse, mouth sores, that's what I think of. And you start to get like little erosions. Um, and sometimes it even affects the foot pads um, and in between their digits. I tend to see it more on the lips. You tend to start to see it on the lips, on the inside of the lips, but it can go to the, in between the toes and the foot pads. And sometimes they can be lame and they just are achy. When they're fever, you know, when you have a fever, you tend to be achy, their muscles can ache all over. But I would see, I would say the upper respiratory sneezing, ocular nasal discharge is going to be uh, what's going to be the most severe. Um, now, one thing I do want to say um, 
that's important on the side. Whenever you have a cat that has an upper respiratory infection, cats have to be able to smell their food to eat. And so a lot of cats that have this, now obviously they may be anorexic because they just don't feel good, but sometimes it's literally because if they don't smell their food, they don't want to eat. So it may be beneficial to clean their eyes and to clean their nose before you feed them. Um, and then we usually try to use very smelly food. Um, a lot of clinics put their cat food in a fridge and it's cold. And sometimes they, you put it in a dish cold. Well, you might wanna add some warm water to it or open a fresh can. Uh, sometimes, you know, at BCA, we obviously feed a good high quality kennel diet, but we always kept a box of Friskies canned food. I mean, I call it like junk food for cats. So if I have a cat that won't eat the hospital diet, sometimes I'll open a can of Friskies and they will gobble it up. And, you know, like I said, sometimes when you're trying to get an animal to eat, yeah, maybe Friskies isn't ideal, but the cat is eating and that's what's ideal. So think about Smelly. We always kept a box of like, and we always kept a couple cans of tuna. You know, I, I kind of say that's like, like the kitty crack or whatever. I mean, like once you open a can of tuna and that's very aromatic, sometimes that'll, but then they get a taste of tuna and then you try to give them their kennel food and they're like, oh no, you fed me tuna yesterday. So these are just tips that you have to think about for nursing care that are part of these diseases is that to get them feeling better, they have to eat. Um, but part of them not being able to smell their food, it's kind of like, it's a double-edged sword. So you have to kind of sometimes with cats, it almost takes a smorgasbord. And a lot of people just assume every cat will eat canned food. I had two cats that would not eat canned food. They were not fans. So always make sure you give them a little dish of dry, maybe like a little dish of dry, a little dish of food with gravy, a little pate. Sometimes you have to figure out what they like. So don't, don't give up too early. Don't give up too early. And we usually kept a bag of lunch meat or sometimes shredded chicken in our kennel fridge just in case. And we've even gone to Arby's sometimes to be like, we had Arby's right by the hospital. So we're like, okay, do I need to go get this dog a uh, chicken or a roast beef? Sometimes cats will eat the little shaved roast beef from Arby's. So just little tips. Um, so the onset um, can be acute. So it can be, it can literally be like they were fine one day, the next day, um, the clinical signs are more severe in young kittens, so that's that blank. If, and obviously, like I said, older cats can get this. It obviously, we see it in young kittens, unvaccinated kittens. But like, if you have an adult cat in a boarding facility, and then you have a kitten that has this and it spreads it, so there is the possibility that, well, hi, AJ. Um, there is a possibility that, wait, let's say hi. It's like your afternoon say hi moment. No. Um, there is a possibility that an adult cat um, is going to get it. Now, the clinical disease is self limiting within five to seven days. And what that means is that they will kind of break with it, maybe within that, you know, 18 to 24 hour, two, three days. And then by day seven, it's not like it's going to get worse. I mean, you do have to watch it. If they don't, if they don't eat and they don't drink and they have a fever and you always worry about secondary infections, there is the chance that this can go kind of beyond and beyond and beyond. So, um, but most cats, um, they, that they recover, they recover in that window Oh, the blank before this one. So the first one, it's more, more severe in young kittens. And the clinical disease is self-limiting within five to seven days. Okay. But again, if they recover, they can shed later in life. And, and that's the thing is, if you have 
an adult cat, they recovered. And you take them to board for two weeks, you go on vacation, and the boarding facility is stressful. That's why sometimes when animals, unfortunately, when animals are brought into a kennel, especially ours at school, they've been at a shelter, or they've been at animal control, or they've been at their rescue, and then they come into our kennel, that's a stressful environment. Sometimes that's why they break with kennel cough, or they break with, you know, other upper respiratory symptoms. So, oh, I gotta still talk about kennel cough. Uh, let me do that. Um, so, actually, if we're talking about viral rhinotracheitis, if there are carriers, it can be reactivated by part tuition, which is giving birth, or immunosuppression. So, if they have some immunosuppressive disease or if they're fighting another illness that can bring it out so again it, it can be dormant and then brought out by this you know i would say immunosuppression slash stressful event boarding traveling new environment uh things like that um and they can shed for up to three weeks um and have clinical signs now the Khaleesi virus, um, the recovered carrier shed virus, um, from about three weeks to continuously for up to, you know, months and years. And they can affect other cats. So the problem is, if they are carriers, and they're dormant carriers, and then these stressful, that's why I like catteries, boarding facilities, shelters are at such a high risk for this to uh, come about. Um, this is what's going to happen. And actually, let me, I'm going to stop there, but I want to go back to, because since I'm kind of talking about this, I want to bring up I didn't finish kennel cough. So I will come back to this cat handout, but let me see if this opens right where I want it to. Okay. And so, sorry, I'm going back to the PowerPoint. So just hold in your notes as far as treatment, but this kind of relates. So I want to try to bring this up here. But the canine, let me see, this is where I stopped. Yep. Yeah. Canine infectious tracheobronchitis, tracheo, but bronchitis. So the difference with kennel cough is the anatomy of where, now this does affect the trachea, but it can affect the bronchi, which are in the lower lung. So this can be an upper respiratory and progress to a lower respiratory tract. Feline viral rhinotracheitis is an upper respiratory infection because it affects the structures of the upper respiratory tract. When you get into kennel cough, it can remain upper respiratory, but it can progress to lower respiratory because it can affect the bronchi. And the causative agent is the Bordetella bronchoseptica. Um, now this one is a gram negative aerobic coxobacillus, which actually almost has like a, it's not quite round and it's not quite a rod. So a bacillus is a rod, a cocci is a circle. So a coxobacillus is a mixture of both. It almost kind of ovally-ish. <laughs> um, but it does attack the respiratory epithelium. So that lining of the trachea, the lining of it can get to, into the nasal passages, but primarily the trachea and the bronchi. Um, and it can be brought out by parainfluenza or canine adenovirus. So those virus is an actually, because kennel cough is a bacteria, okay? So, but it can be brought out by these viruses. And this is aerosolized. So again, just like I talked about in the cat, what's bad about this is anytime it's coughed, breathing, it's going to be spread very easily because it's aerosolized. 
you know, and that's the issue with coronavirus that we're dealing with right now is because it's carried through respiratory droplets. Hence, people wear masks to prevent you from inhaling those respiratory droplets. But it can also be spread by the, you know, fomites, which, you know, food dishes. You touch a dog, you touch the next dog. Um, but it doesn't typically affect anywhere except the respiratory tract. So it's pretty much stays there. And if they've been exposed, they can kind of see clinical signs within three to 10 days with this. Now, um, what's interesting, um, doing okay on time. Um, the clinical signs, one of the key clinical signs is a coughing, but they tend to retch. It's like they cough and then they go, ah. it's like a, ah, ah. it's a very dry sounding cough. It's not moist. It's a very dry, hacky, but there's like a hat ah, and then tend to cough up a little bit of foam afterwards. Now, again, this isn't vomiting and this isn't, uh, you know, it's not really salivating. It's almost like a foam that they cough up. It can be some phlegm, um, but most of the time kennel cough is not green. So typically if an animal has pneumonia, a deep infection in the lung, they do cough up a yellowy green uh, sputum, but normally kennel cough is just white foam that they kind of cough up because they feel like they have irritation back there. So they constantly feel like they're trying to clear their throat and that's what's happening. But most of the time when they're not coughing, they're fine. So outside of the kennel cough, they seem to be have normal activity, normal interaction with their owner. Um, it can, you know, when they start coughing, it can progress to laryngitis because they're coughing so much, it causes the laryngeal folds to get in edema and swell. And that, that makes more of a honking cough. So it can start like a dry hack. It can progress to like a honking cough. Um, and then usually if you go in and when we say elicit a cough on tracheal palpation, you reach in your dog's neck and you try to pinch their trachea. Now, this isn't the best exclusive test, you know, because most of you, I'm sure if you pinch your dog's trachea at home, they might go, <laughs> but they're not gonna like, they shouldn't go into like a massive coughing fit uh, for like an extended period of time. Um, but eventually what's gonna happen is they don't wanna eat because they feel irritated, they're always coughing. I also worry about dogs that can't get through a meal or drinking water without coughing. So if it progresses to this cough that will not stop and they can't eat, and then they just start to get a fever from the inflammation. And then what happens is anytime you have fever, you have inflammation, you get these secondary infections. And if it progresses to a mucoid or mucopurulent, so mucoid is thick and mucopurulent would be yellow to green, nasal and ocular discharge, then that's a sign that it's becoming a secondary infection that can lead to pneumonia. Now, pneumonia is when they have an infection in their lungs. And that pneumonia is a lower respiratory tract disease. If you remember from anatomy, you had upper respiratory tract structures, lower respiratory tract, anything that affects the lungs, the bronchi, the bronchioles, um, and that's pneumonia. They're little the little alveoli, the little air sacs, get filled with this mucopurulent discharge, and that's why they can't breathe as well, because they're not exchanging oxygen. They're all they're all kind of full. Um, and then the diagnostics is pretty much based on their physical exam and especially their history. Um, I'll give you an interesting, I worked an ER shift not long ago at VCA and a lab came in and she's like, oh my gosh, my dog won't stop vomiting. And when the dog came in the back, it was a big yellow lab, adult, like five or six years old. And she was crazy and she was playing around. But when she was back there and I was getting ready to call the owner to get the history because we're curbside and she started hacking, coughing, and then she started like 
coughing up these piles of foam. She'd go, hur, hur, and then she'd wag her tail and she'd be fine. So when I called the owner, I was like, has she been coughing? And she goes, well, you know, now I think she's been coughing. So the, the presenting concern was vomiting. And as we watched her in the back, and then I said, well, has she been to a dog park, a boarding facility lately? And she goes, well, my daughter came to stay with me and brought her three-month-old puppy. Oh, and you know, my daughter's, pop, my daughter's puppy is coughing. It, it's kind of funny when these clients have an epiphany that they didn't tell anybody. But as I started to question her, because I'm like, we're all kind of looking at this dog. I'm like, this dog acts like a kennel cough dog. This doesn't look like vomiting. And then she said, oh yeah, well the vomit's just like foam and it happens when she coughs. So pretty much you can see how I dug into the history and found out, yeah, the daughter brought the puppy to stay with her at her house. Puppy was three months old, puppy's coughing too. So sent the can, you know, we said, well, and there was no ocular nasal discharge. There wasn't a fever. It was pretty much straight up cough. Gave some cough suppressant, anti-inflammatories, and sent her home. So um, sometimes you can do radiographs and blood work and chem panel, but a lot of times they're not going to show anything. Like we did end up taking a radiograph of this dog because we worried about aspiration pneumonia potentially, but the x-ray was clear. So sometimes you want to do a radiograph to make sure that it hasn't progressed to the lungs yet. If the lungs look normal, then we know we're probably still at the upper stage where it's just affecting uh, the trachea. But in cultures, sometimes we will take cultures, especially if you have a pneumonia, sometimes we culture what they cough up to make sure we use the proper antibiotic. The thing with this is that sometimes is that the bacteria causing the infection or is that some of their normal bacteria? And typically we don't really do serology testing or virus isolation. Most kennel cough cases are pretty shut and dry or you, you pretty much they're coughing, they've been somewhere, they've been at a boarding, uh, they have access to like that client, another puppy, and then that kind of points us in a direction. Um, I'm going to stop there and sorry that I jumped around, but since I was talking about respiratory, I was like, we did not finish talking about kennel cough. So tomorrow, <coughs> that was not on cue, <laughs> a tickle. <laughs> um, Tomorrow, I'll finish up this little bit of kennel cough, pick back up with the treatment because they're they kind of go together a little bit, and then we'll we'll start finishing up with the um, uh, feline one. Are there any questions?